when we're in the midst of an experience, all of our five senses plug us into the environment. And as our, we're gathering all of this data from this event, all of that information rushes back to our brain and causes jungles of neurons to organize themselves into networks. That, 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 that information is being structured physically in the brain. And, it's, and when that occurs, it's enriching circuitry. So it's stamping networks of neurons to reinforce what we understood philosophically. But then the brain makes a chemical and that chemical is called a feeling or an emotion. And feelings and emotions are the end product of past experiences and we can, we can learn from our experiences. So once you practice being compassionate, once you practice being more humble, once you practice being successful, once you apply all these concepts, you begin to teach your body chemically or emotionally to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So we could say knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body. And when you do it right, you get to embody knowledge and it becomes the truth. The effect of that biologically is not only do we reshape the brain, but we begin to signal new genes in new ways. And now the word is becoming flesh. So then it's not enough to do it once. You can't forgive your coworker. You can't forgive your ex husband or your ex-wife or you, you, you just can't let go of a past event one time and expect to be canonized as a saint. The idea is to be able to replicate it, to be able to do it over and over again. And if you can do something over and over again from a biological standpoint, you go from thinking to doing to being. You go from philosopher to initiate to master, from mind to body to soul. And when we can teach our body chemically and neurologically enough times to do something over and over again, the mind and body begin to merge as one. In other words, we've practiced it so many times, we no longer have to think about it. It's innate in us, it's who we are. And so I think this is a time in history where it's important for us to break free from some of the chains of those conditioned beliefs about us being limited and that we're powerless and that um, uh, we have to survive and compete and and do certain things to, to, to get what we want in our life, that a new paradigm has to be created. And then we have to set up the conditions in our environment or conditions within our own world to begin to execute some of these. And I think that when we arrive at that state of being, then we give people permission to do the same. And, and that's when we start really seeing uh, some really strong uh, strides in people's lives. So in my personal life, I mean, I like to wake up in the morning and I ask myself the same question every single day before I get out of bed. And that is, what is the greatest ideal of myself that I can be? Now, we have this amazing faculty because of the size of the frontal lobe. It, we call it neuroscience metacognition. And it means that we can think about what we're thinking about. We can begin to pay attention to how we're acting and we can notice how we're feeling. And because of that, it allows us to modify our states of mind and body to do a better job in life. So then if you say to yourself, who do I want to be when I open my eyes? How can I contribute to the world? What do I know that I can put into practice? And you begin to think about a new way of being. You begin to plan your behaviors, speculate possibilities, review the choices you're going to make and the choices you're not going to make. If you keep redoing this enough times, you'll begin to install the circuits in your brain, prime your brain to turn on certain circuits so that you, when you open your eyes, you'll naturally be in that state. And if you can emotionally embrace who you're going to be when you open your eyes, you're giving your body a sampling of the future. So when you get up thinking and feeling differently than when you started the day, the side effect of that is that you're in a new state of being. Thoughts are the language of the brain and feelings are the language of the body and how we think and how we feel creates a state of being. So the idea then is to, mo to maintain that modified state of mind and body your entire day. And if you can, something unusual is going to show up in your life. That's the law. And it will always come in a way that we least expect that surprises us and leaves no doubt that what we did inside of us produce some effect outside of us. And that's when we begin to start to experience empowerment. And people around the world are waking up to these ideas and, and they're doing the uncommon and they're doing it repeatedly and they're taking 
a certain amount of power that's been invested in everything outside of them and putting it back in themselves. And I think that's a, a great honor to be able to contribute to people's lives in that way. If we start off by talking about just those vibrational states, we basically live in two states of mind. We live in survival or we live in creation. Now living in survival is living in stress. And stress is when your body's knocked out of homeostasis. Stress is when your body's knocked out of balance. The stress response is what your body innately does to return itself back to order. So you have different types of stressors. You have physical stress like injury, trauma, accidents, falls. You have chemical stress like vexes and blood sugar levels and hormones and hangovers. And then you have emotional stress, you know, uh, family tragedies, second mortgages, single parenting, you know, uh, 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 finances. And every one of those things begin to knock the brain and body out of balance because when we perceive a threat or a stress in our external world, we turn on a nervous system called the fight or flight nervous system and we mobilize enormous amounts of energy. us for some event in our external world. Now the problem with that is is that all organisms in nature can tolerate short-term stress. Zebra gets chased by a lion, you're driving down the road in your car, you get cut off, the hormones of stress turn on, but 15-20 minutes later you adapt and your body returns back to balance and you go to work or you, the zebra goes back to grazing and the event is over. Human beings are a little different because we can turn on that stress response just by thought alone. We can begin to think about some future worst case scenario in our life. And out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, we're selecting the worst possible future based on the memory of the past. And that limited imagination and pre preparing ourselves for the event, embracing ourselves for that outcome, begins to knock the body out of physiological balance just by thought alone. In other words, the body is the unconscious mind begins to believe it's in that future event in the present moment and we begin to create the stress response just by thought alone. We could also unfold the past bitter memory that's tattooed in the recesses of our gray matter. We can revisit that event over and over again. We can produce the same chemistry in the brain and body as if the event occurred. Now it's the redundancy of that process that begins to condition the body emotionally to become the mind. And when the body becomes the mind, that's called a habit. So 95% of who we are by the time we're 35 years old. 
is a set of memorized behaviors, emotional reactions, beliefs, perceptions, attitudes that function just like a subconscious computer program. So then the emotions of anger, aggression, frustration, hatred, judgment, fear, anxiety, insecurity, unworthiness, uh, guilt, shame, sadness, pain, they're all derived from the hormones of stress. And 70% of the time or more, most people live in those emotional straight states. So when we're living by those emotional states, those chemicals endorse the ego to become selfish, self-involved, self-centered, self-indulgent, self-important, self-aggrandizing, self-pity. It's all about the self. Now, in survival, frog or a, uh, a feline, whether you're a human being, whether you're a lizard, when those chemicals are turned on, it's all about taking care of the body. So then the moment we turn on the stress response, if we turn on the stress response and we can't turn it off, now we're headed for disease because no organism can tolerate living in emergency mode for extended periods of time. So as we mobilize all this energy, for our external environment, there's no energy in our internal environment for growth and repair. So then the organism is always looking in the external environment to determine what's going to be a threat, always concerned about its body and where it has to, how it has to take care of it. And it's always concerned about time. How much time do I have to get there? The body, the environment and time. Now, when you and I live by the hormones of stress, the very fact that we're we're releasing all these chemicals by paying all of our attention on the external environment we focus on objects and things and we believe that the outer world is more real than the inner world and this is where we start to feel separation now why do we feel separation because the hormones of stress cause us to begin to really to to begin to understand or perceive reality as a materialist defining reality with our senses. So the atom is 99.9999999% nothing. It's energy, it's emptiness, it's open space. It's 0.0000001% particle. And when we're living by the hormones of stress, we're focusing on the particle instead of on possibility. And this is where we get in trouble because when we get to this point and we experience that level of separation, we always try to force and control outcomes in our life because we are matter trying to change matter. I really hope you loved this video and it was helpful. So please help me make it more popular by giving your thumbs up, commenting it and sharing on the social networks with your friends. And now it's time for our daily complete the quote challenge. If you're new to this, your job is to complete the inspiring quote we choose for you and write the correct answer in comments below the video. If you can give us the right answer first, you're the winner of this daily challenge. In the previous video, we had a quote that belongs to Joe Dispenza. We were looking for two words. The quote goes like this. Turn your brain from a record of the past into a map of... And the correct answer was the future. So, turn your brain from a record of the past into a map of the future. Congratulations to everyone with the correct answer. And to everyone who tried but didn't guess the answer. Today we also have the quote from Joe Dispenza. The quote goes like this. Here's my definition of intention. Getting clear on what? So we are missing for two words. If you know the correct answer, write it down in the comments below. Even if you're not sure what the correct answer is, try and guess. And find out the right answer in the next video. 
If you like this video and our challenge, give your thumbs up and share this video with your friends. Spread the word. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button. By doing that, you will get notification when my new video and new challenge is out. If you really like what we do here and want to support us, you can join our channel and our community for a symbolic fee and gain many other additional features. You can do that by clicking the join button next to the subscribe button. Or you can click on the link in the description of this video. Stay good and have a great day!